Muhammad Ali coined the phrase that Buster Douglas made into a promise in Tokyo. I can still see and hear Ali after upsetting Sonny Liston, yelling to singer Sam Cooke at ringside, Sam, did I shock the world. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for appearing with us at our studios. And before we start, could you uh, shake hands and come out talking here? <laughs> Both of you shocked the world in Tokyo. Buster, you in the ring, and Mike, you outside of the ring after the fight. Let's get to the controversy first and get through that. The impression left with all the business about the long count is that you and Don King tried to use your influence to either turn the decision around or to avoid it. And that after there was this huge public outcry he decided to take a U-turn, a flip-flop, and say, we didn't quite mean that. What we meant was we wanted a rematch. Give us your spin on what that was all about. Well, Larry, if you could recollect, we were, no one was protesting, especially not myself. I was just um, um, pointing at the fact of what had happened. The referee, he took, I, I, I gave my comment of what had happened. I mean, by no means, Buster fought a great fight. You don't want to take that away from him. You know what I mean? It would be cheap. You couldn't consider yourself champion if somebody defaulted like that. But, you know what I mean? He deserves being champion of the world, and I commend him on effort. You know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? I by no means made a protest of changing the decision. You did say afterwards, I consider myself still the champion. I don't think what happened was fair. No, I said it wasn't fair what happened. But then again, how many things in boxing is not fair? You know what I mean? I, was, I had 37 good nights. But then again, I could say, well, I say I'm champion because I still consider myself the best fighter in the world. Take us through the process. You go back to your dressing room after the fight. How did you first hear about this supposed long count? How was it presented to you? What was your reaction? Um, before, like, the fight, like, when the fight was, um, when I went in the dressing room, I, I, I commented, I said, um, that, count was, that count was a little long, I said. You did. Yeah, I, said, like, I thought that count was a little long. Not making a big deal, but then people that came and protested the situation, like the Japanese officials that came in and the WBC and the um, WBA, and they made a big issue of the situation. But by all means, nobody's crying over spilled milk, you know what I mean? Buster, you know what I mean, if he believes he's the champion of the world, we'll do it again. Buster, you take us through the process you went. When did you first hear that there was a protest being lodged, and what were your thoughts at that moment? Uh, once I got back to the hotel, I really didn't uh, understand, you know, uh, what the situation was totally about. Because as far as I knew, I was up before the count of ten. They were saying it was a long count, and to my knowledge, it was at six. Well, I picked it up at six. Did your manager, John Johnson, tell you about this? Yeah, it was What John. did he say to you? What did you say to him? He said that Tyson and King were protesting the count in the eighth round. Was there confusion at that moment? Was there fear that the, the fight could be voided? Or did, a, that, or did that happen later? No, it was, well, yeah, it was confusion. Uh, I didn't know exactly what uh, the deal was. Because all I was concerned with was getting my belts. When you heard that the WBA and the WBC were withholding judgment on the entire fight, were you afraid that there was some political thing going on here that would cost you your victory? Well, basically, I thought that, um, you know, it was bogus. I really didn't uh, put any stock in it. And I thought, I figured that if it was, if it came down to me being stripped of the titles, then that the public would know who the real heavyweight champion was. They would recognize me because they seen the results of the fight. When you finally did get home to Columbus, and there was still a furor, and it was still unknown what was going to happen. Were your fears raised at that time? No, I was a disappointment due to the fact that I didn't receive the championship belts. I mean, I was declared the winner in the ring, but yet you know, I only received one belt. And then once, once I received the belt and got back to the hotel, they said that it was being protested and that the WBC and the WBA wasn't sanctioned in the fight. Did it ruin the party for you? Did it ruin the best time of your life in some way? In one respect it did. In another, the victory itself was still, I still felt that I won the fight, uh, but it was just that it wasn't completed. 
being completed was receiving the belts. Mike, you're a student of boxing history, perhaps the best student I've ever known of his sport. Jack Dempsey, when he lost to Tunney, said, Honey, I forgot to duck. Uh, Muhammad Ali, when he lost to Joe Frazier, clutched his swollen jaw and said, Boy, he could sure punch better than I thought he could. The impression that this left with a lot of people is that you couldn't handle defeat. Is, is that what you wanted people to think? Not, not by all means. You know, it's so ludicrous to even make a statement like that. You know what I mean? Those things happen. You know, I, mean, I dealt with defeats all my life, being an amateur. Those things that both have fought a good fight. I fought a bad fight. We'll do it again, hopefully. What about the apologies from Don King when they finally came? Uh, did that satisfy you, or did you feel he wasn't acting in your best interest, Buster? Well, it satisfied me. Um, then, as I said in the interview before, I, I said that, you know, it was just a... You know, you never, you never can... Uh, you know, Don, Don has always been upright with me. You know, he's been putting me on the cars, you know, uh, on the end of cars of world championship fights, giving me the opportunity to show my wares. And even th even though at times it's been that it wasn't at the best performances, but he's always been uh, up front with me. And I've never been in a position where I could tell Don that, you know, he was wrong or that I've had, I've had the best of him, gotten the best of him. And in this situation, it seems like it's still like that because of the fact the way the, the outcome has came. You know, with all the uh, controversy that was involved in the fight. Mike, do you feel embarrassed by what Don King did, or do you feel he's fighting for your best interest? Well, I mean, he, um, from my knowledge, he did what he thought was the best thing. Personally, you know, I mean, I, I, if he felt that was right, you know, I mean, protesting, personally, I, you, just, you just take it as, you, as it comes, you know what I mean? You talk it like you walk it, you know what I mean? By all means, I know Buster didn't beat the real Mike Tyson. He fought a great fight, no doubt. But I know. Was the controversy over the long count real or contrived? Did the referee blunder as he first admitted and then recanted? Did the true count get lost in translation? Let's go to the tape. Here's the knockdown again. We'll examine it in a moment. First, it's clear from this slow motion replay that the knockdown timekeeper and the referee aren't synchronized. They're off by two seconds in their counts. When the timekeeper signals two, Octavio Meron is just picking up the count. Now, if you notice the elapsed time of the knockdown, it's just under 14 seconds. But we'll show you later why the referee, in the context of common practice in boxing, performed normally. He did not err. Second, the question of whether Buster Douglas could have gotten up earlier in the count. At Mehran's count of two, Douglas bangs the canvas with his glove in disgust for getting careless, seemingly coherent. At five, he starts to get up as he listens intently to the count, then relaxes for another two counts, and he's up comfortably at nine. Third, something no one's raised. The timekeeper gave a quick count. He starts at one as soon as Douglas hits the canvas. Theoretically, he should begin his first count approximately one second after he hits the canvas. In any event, it's the referee's count that's decisive, not the timekeeper's. Seven, eight, nine. Okay. Fourth, an interesting coincidence. The elapsed time of the knockout of Mike Tyson in the 10th round. You got it. 14 seconds. So 
So it's pretty well established that the 10 count took 14 seconds to implement for both fighters. What hasn't been fully explained is why the rest of what happened in the fight happened. Mike, let's get to the knockdowns first. You knocked him down in the eighth round. Did you feel at that very moment it was a long count? Were you angry when he got up that the bell rang? Well, somebody had told me, um, I guess it was my trainers, was saying, because I was watching the count, and he said the fight is over. He, he, he stopped him. I mean, cause I, I he was hitting the rope and he was jumping. You know, but I, I know it didn't happen, you know. And, and, you know, you're in the wrong, I'm in the wrong position to complain because, you know, regardless of it, um, it was a long count or not, regardless, those things happen. Were you frustrated that the bell rang, that you didn't have a chance to finish him? Well, you know, I mean, it took me by all at first, yeah. What about you? If that happened in the middle of the round, Buster, could, did you have enough left to survive? Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I, wasn't, I wasn't hurt. You know, I just basically, you know, I was off balance, and I just went back, fell back. Because if you see the tape when I hit the canvas, I was upset with myself of not being in the right position. As I was leaning over, and he caught me with a shot and knocked me back. As I got up on strong legs, and I immediately picked him up in the corner, expecting for him to come charging over to finish me. So there's never been any doubt in, for a moment you that you could have gotten up w much earlier in the count. Right. Now, surely you understand that, knowing boxing, Mike, that he's supposed to follow the referee's count, uh, and that he can't possibly know whether it's long or not. Yeah, but, but of course I'm not blaming him. Mm -hmm. I'm not blaming anybody. It's, it's something um, perverted that happened at the particular time. You know what I mean? You, you can't cry, you know, you can't cry over things like that. Cause... What about your knockdown, Mike? Uh -huh. Were you shocked at this end as other people were shocked, finding well, yourself on the canvas, reaching for your mouthpiece? Well, I, was, um, I wasn't incoherent because I was trying to get my mouthpiece in my mouth. But the situation was like my weird, weird clashing heads in there, and I couldn't see that well, and I couldn't see the right hand coming. I see. What about the rest of the fight, Mike? You've looked, mm -hmm. you both looked at the tapes. What was he able to do to you that other fighters weren't able to do? Well, well yes, what a good night. He had a good fight that night. Why weren't you able to get at him? Some people have claimed you didn't have your normal fiery spirit in the ring with you that that night. Well, regardless of the situation, why it wasn't fighting well, I mean, you can't take from the fact that you know Buster won the championship. Did you so, feel that 90% of Mike Tyson could beat 110% of Buster Douglas? Were you overconfident? Well, I'm not going to say that. I mean, I won't make a statement like that. Buster, did you have a game plan? You said immediately after the fight I was fighting him on instinct. Surely you must have had some game plan. Well, get off first. That was the whole point. Use my speed and lateral movement. Other fighters, their instincts for self-preservation kicks in almost immediately as the fight starts and they begin to sense Mike's speed and power. But you didn't seem to be rattled by that. That, it seemed to me, was the key to your winning, that you stayed in there with him. Well, yes, I'm a man, and he is a man also. And, and I accepted his challenge. When I signed that contract to fight for the heavyweight championship, I signed to fight for the heavyweight championship. And it was an opportunity of a lifetime for me, and I made the best of it. I prepared well for the fight, and everything just went, as, went, went according to plan. You keep hinting here, Mike, that this was not the Mike Tyson. Were you in the best shape you could be in? I've read now that you may have been 10 to 20 pounds uh, over your fighting weight uh, a few weeks before the fight, that maybe you weren't as disciplined in your food and drink as you normally would be before a fight. Were you as focused as you should have been? You know, I can't, you know, I can't comment. Buster, you know what I mean? Saying anything like that is just, you know what I mean, just distorting away from the champion. And that's this far, you know what I mean? He's the champion of the world. And I fought a fight, you know what I mean? I didn't fight my best fight. He fought a splendid fight. You know what I mean? I'm looking forward to getting it together again. I mean, Looking backward, was the fact that Greg Page knocked you down in, in training, which has happened to you before and happens uh -huh. to a lot of fighters, did that indicate some laxness, some lack of focus on your part? 
See, you must understand the fact that was just blowing out of proportion about me getting knocked down. Mm -hmm. I never got knocked down in training. You know what I mean? I've trained and I didn't have great sessions and everything. You know, that's normal when training. Things like that happen. But like I said, I mean, two guys fought that night and he had a better night. Buster, usually Mike establishes his dominance very early in the fight. Could you see anything different in, in the first round, second, third rounds? that he knew suddenly that it, he wasn't going to be dominant? Could you see, sense anything or see anything in his eyes? No, because he continued to come in. He continued to, you know, make his attack. He never stopped fighting. Uh, it was nothing that I seen that where, you know, I felt that I was in control. You know, I felt, if anything, in the eighth round, I started admiring my work, admiring the fact that I was in there, you know, doing so well and got caught with a shot. I had a little a lax a lax a relaxed moment and I think it cost me for that on that knockdown. But uh other than that, no, I never sensed uh seeing how Mike was, you know, had started faltering because he was strong throughout the fight. He took good shots and he and he kept fighting. He never once, you know, seemed to be where he was giving up. Now we want to show you some startling footage. Footage that shows that history repeats itself and that the 10 count isn't what any of us thought it was, and until now, had no reason to question. September 22, 1927, Soldier Field, Chicago. The rematch of the champion Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey, a part of the mythology of boxing. Because Dempsey had hovered over decked opponents throughout his career, a new rule was in force. When a fighter was knocked down, the count would begin only when the other fighter goes to a neutral corner. Dempsey dropped Tunney in the seventh round, but forgot the new rule. So the referee properly picked up the count late. Tunney barely got up at nine. Looking closely at the controversy, Dempsey surely put Tunney down with a vicious combination. By failing to go to the neutral corner, the clock shows that the referee's count begins at five seconds. The crucial sidelight to this controversy is that at the count of four, Tunney is clearly looking at the referee, ready to continue. Nine seconds of real time had elapsed on the clock. The clear-headed Tunney could have gotten up and gone on. He went on to win the decision, but for a long time, people believed that but for Dempsey's goof, he would have recaptured the title. Uh, what about that uh, Gene Tunney long count without the end? Well, I hope so, because that was one of the greatest breaks I ever got. And the reason I say that, a lot of my friends who saw the fight still think I won it. As long as I can make them still think that, I say I'm a pretty lucky guy because Gene's a pretty small fellow. Under the scrutiny of today's technology and media, the myth would have been dispelled much earlier. 63 years after that celebrated incident, Tunney's stare at the referee was duplicated by Buster Douglas. The rule. When a contestant is knocked down, the referee shall audibly announce the count as he motions with his right arm downward, indicating the end of each second of the count. If the contestant taking the count is still down when the referee calls the count of ten, the referee will wave both arms, indicating that the contestant has been knocked out. The letter of the rule presents a paradox between the count of the referee and the count of some imaginary timepiece that neither he nor the timekeeper uses in the heat of battle. The 14 second knockout is commonplace.
So Octavio Mehron was doing in Tokyo just what comes naturally to all referees. All right, we've examined the fight from every angle but a canvas cam, a camera from underneath the ring, and the corner cams. Douglas naturally had a happy corner. Tyson, curiously, a rather calm corner. Mike, did you know you were in trouble in this fight? Was your corner alerting you to the fact that you were falling behind and that you needed to do something fierce and dramatic? Well, you know, I never think about that. I never have that in my mind. I mean, think about being behind. You know, it was a tough fight, and you know, I had to come back and fight hard. Don't you think it's a corner's job to say, listen, Mike, you're, you are behind, and you got to step it up? Yeah, they, 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 exp they expressed that. You know, I mean, I knew it's, it's a matter of time I'll catch the guy. I mean, I was just trying to, I was doing my best to come on, but as you say, we were clashing heads, and I was trying to face him on the other side because it was very difficult for me to see him from my left side. Your corner only had a problem after the eighth round. What was the sense of it there? How did they deal with it? After the knockdown? Yes. Well, they, they uh, you know, whisked me down and questioned me to see if my faculties was in order. And after they found out that I was all right, then they went on and instructed me to, to further to continue fighting. You know, they instructed me in a way to continue to fight. Well, I mean, did they say, look, he's going to come out after you. You've got to buy time. No, never. He came out after me every round. Uh, you know, so it was, we knew where he was coming. So you were going to find out real quick uh, whether you could deal with him after the knockdown. Right, right. Mike, you've repeatedly stated you couldn't see out of that left eye. How much did it contribute, do you think, to the beating you finally took in the ninth and tenth rounds? Well, you know, I mean, regardless of my difference, I, you know, I mean, one of them was close. I had another one. That's all that mattered to me. You know, I mean, taking the punches wasn't nothing. I mean, but you couldn't see out of that eye, well, and he, you, and he was hitting you with right, with right hands. Well, my heart was beating. That's all that mattered. So I just kept fighting. Mm -hmm. Are you angry at all at the men in your corner for not treating the eye in the, in the right way, in the accepted way? They didn't have an end swell to try to move it. They didn't have an ice bag. You, know I mean, you can't blame. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to, you can't, no one, anyone tried it, because you must have been thinking of reading those papers. People saying you had a, um, a, a corner that was, you know what I mean, um, mature, immature. You know, that's ridiculous. We went out there, you know what I mean? We lost to the guy that fought the best that night. But you know, there was no reason. Regardless of what, you got, you got your eyes closed, you got one eye. You have another one, I mean, use that one. You fight to the finish, man. You can't make no excuses. Perception out there is that you have surrounded yourself with some affable fellows who, who you like and who like you and make you feel good, but that they don't have the authority to drive Mike Tyson to the furthest point in training to really move him. Is that, a, is that an accurate picture? No, and that's, you know, I mean, that's a ridiculous insult on behalf of my intelligence because the people that um, I have involved in me, the people that I trust, and people are basically my childhood friends, John Horn and Rory Holloway, you know what I mean? I mean, you can't blame them. You can't look for somebody to blame or something, you know what I mean, because they're young and they're inexperienced. They're on the job training. No, what, what, what the charge is is that you're at fault for not bringing more professional guys that could push you. What, bring somebody that comes in like a week before the fight and train me or something? That's ridiculous. Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, the people that I'm with, I'm very comfortable with. It's just that I, out of 37 fights, I had 37 good nights, and at the 38th, I had one bad night. You know what I mean, there's no means, of, you know, no doubt in my mind, regardless of his decision, he's running around, you know what I mean, running off with his mouth saying he's going to fight, make me wait, I was the mm -hmm. manager, make me wait, he's going to fight. Regardless of who he fights, you know, I'm, I'm going to get my title back, regardless. If you fight Holyfield, and hopefully I'm going to get it back from Holyfield, regardless. Lester, we've talked about uh, Mike's conditioning, yet you were sick for a week and a half before the fight, and, and you're never famous for being in top, top condition. How did that affect you? Well, it had no effect, I guess. Uh, I went out there and fought the best fight I could. You know, like I said, I signed the fight for the weight championship. The dream Weren't you taking from. penicillin and other drugs? I was taking penicillin and antihistamine and some, uh, some, uh, this mouthwash to gargle from my throat because I had inflamed, uh, my throat was swollen also. So I was a bit under the weather also. But the fight pumped you up so much that it didn't affect you at all? Well, I fought to the best of my capabilities. I got, I got out of what, what, what I had. When all the punches are fired, sometimes the real firing is just starting. 
A lot of questions were answered and answers questioned after Tyson Douglas, or to put it in its post-fight frame of reference, Douglas Tyson. Other questions to consider. Should a fighter who has been so thoroughly beaten as Tyson was take an immediate rematch? Is anyone considering that? And what of promoter Don King? Ringside observers were so mesmerized by the action in the ring that they didn't notice King immediately and desperately making a protest to Jose Suleiman of the WBC after the eighth round knockdown. He still wasn't sure that Tyson could pull the fight out, so he would try to save his title outside the ring. His motives were revealed in a choreographed post-fight press conference. Everybody is seeing the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. A public outcry erupted. King and Tyson were seen as alibying losers. The commissions reacted by finally recognizing Buster Douglas as the undisputed champion, but only after two of the three, the WBA and the WBC, killed some of the joy of the upset by at first withholding the claim. Finally, when they arrived in New York, Tyson and King conceded the title. There's never been a question from our side as to who the heavyweight champion of the world was. And I respect the fact that the new, the new champion won the title. But the only thing I'm saying, I wasn't trying, I wouldn't want the title on a change decision, you know what I mean? You win the title in the ring, you lose it in the ring, I believe. I'm just saying that Mike's not going on the deep end, he's not discouraged. The only thing I asked for is just a rematch, that's all. Simple as that. Once I get a rematch, I'll take care of everything from there. That's all I'm asking for as a champion. And what about the brouhaha surrounding the Tyson cornermen past and present? Ex-trainer Kevin Rooney, fired by Tyson, ripped his unsuccessful successors. But Tyson gave a loyal vote of confidence to co-trainers Aaron Snow and Jay Bright. An issue of their competence is why they used a bloated ice bag for the swollen eye. Today, the end swell is the accepted piece of hardware to lessen the puffiness which causes the eye to close. But don't expect changes in Tyson's corner. When the fight was over, I noted that if you have a secretariat, you don't put any jockey on him, you get the best. Because even great athletes occasionally need help to get out of trouble, which Tyson definitely was in. Here with us to discuss that trouble and his corner and other aspects of the fight are Gil Clancy, the boxing commentator for CBS in Madison Square Garden, a former trainer and manager and promoter, and Angelo Dundee, who also has spent a thousand and one nights in corners. Gentlemen, you were watching the fight. You saw the corner work. Did it keep Mike Tyson from having a chance to retain his title? Well, the biggest fault that I found with the corner, uh, technically, is the fact that they didn't have an end swell. If you don't have an end swell to, to, to control that swelling, you're going to have problems. Then they tried to do it with an ice bag, and what they forgot to do, when you have an ice bag, you pack it tight with ice. But when it's there, air gets in it, and water, the ice melts. So what you have to do between each round, you have to unscrew the top and take the water out so that you have a real tight fit when you put that ice up against that swelling and try to work it out. You know, end swell is not that uh, newer thing. Before end swell, we used to use a silver dollar. And I was always more effective in a corner because I'd always have that silver dollar. This guy couldn't go for more than a half a buck. <laughs> You were setting us up there, Gil. Angelo, ninth and tenth rounds, Tyson caught a lot of punches because his eye was closed, yet he still had enough power to have knocked him down in the eighth. Did he still have a chance to win that if his eye wasn't as bad? I don't think the eye was that big a deal, really. I don't mm -hmm. think it actually closed. Mm -hmm. uh, the only comment I got to make about the eye, that it was just whatever he had, he, that abortion he had in the corner, he just held it against the eye. Well, you don't get a swelling out of an eye if you don't move it away from the eye. That was not enough. We used ice bags much longer than before we used end swell. Do you think that he was alerted clearly enough to the trouble he was in 
and motivated to go out there and do anything about it. Well, you know, uh, Angelo in the fight with when, when Sugar Ray Leonard fought Tommy Hearns the first time, time, I have to give Angelo all the credit in the world because he, he told Ray Leonard, you're blowing the fight, son. Nowadays, these guys are afraid to talk to the fighters. They're afraid to make the fighter angry at them. They forget what their job is. They're his friend, his uncle, or his mm. confidant, whatever, but they're not guys that are motivated. Sometimes you have to use different psychology, but you have to do something to wake a guy up. Haven't you slapped a champion of the world around in the corner? Well, you know, it's a funny thing. Sometimes you look at a fighter, and he's looking at you, and he looks like he's hypnotized. He's not paying a bit of attention. He's going like this with his head. But really, he's not paying attention, and you have to get his attention. And on, with Emil Griffith, when he won the welterweight championship, I saw he was that way. And I gave him a little slap, and it woke him up. And next round, by luck or whatever, he went out, and he scored a knockout. But you have to do different things to motivate fighters. You just can't let it go round after round at the same pace if you're losing. Angelo, outside of Douglas's relatives and close friends, you're the only one I know on the planet who gave him a real chance to win this fight. Why? Had the credentials, had the right guy behind him. Not too many people knew John Johnson. I co-managed a fighter with John Johnson. I know what type of individual he is. He had the motivation. He's a goal guy, John Johnson. And I knew Douglas, strong, tough, 6'4", good left hand, mobility, he got motivated by A. John Johnson. He has different folks for different strokes. You were talking about the corner job. Snow was a competent guy, but you know what was wrong? He worships at Tyson Shrine. I don't worship my fighters. I'm there to give them, try to ad-lib something. I never know what the heck I'm going to do. In fact, you know, sometimes I've used some stuff, you know, that they beat me out a little bit. But you do whatever you got to do to get your fighter up. And the one time when I saw Tyson in the corner and his head was down, I blew my stack. Because I had to tell him, get your stinking head up. You're a world champion. Because that would have blew my stack. Was Mike Tyson in shape in your judgment? Can you see? Well, you know, uh, I think Mike Tyson, his weight was down. He was 220 pounds. But uh, you can train for two months or three months. But it's what you've been doing for the last year or so. And I think a lot of Tyson's... Uh, Loose living caught up with him on that night. Let's go to a rematch. Forget the money. The man has just taken a beating. You're his trainer. Do you want him to get back in the ring with the same guy who just gave him a beating four months or six months later? Well, I, you know, Mike Tyson has a lot of pride. And, you know, he did show a lot of courage in that fight because even when he had no legs, he was still throwing dangerous punches. But I don't see what the hurry is uh, myself unless he figures he's never going to get another a shot at the championship of the world uh, and again mike tyson is going to be fighting under a disadvantage now that he, he always had a tremendous tremendous advantage with intimidation he was the greatest fighter on the world nobody could beat him iron mike tyson and i've always said he's not iron he's made out of flesh and blood all that stuff came to pass when he goes in the ring next time it's going to be more even because the other guy's not going to have that much respect for him what happens in a rematch angelo I think Douglas wins unless it's a complete turnabout in every which way of Tyson. What do you think? I, I would have to say that uh, unless my unless and it's, even as they say in this fight, even at the very end of the fight, Mike Tyson was throwing punches with bad intentions. You have to give him credit for that. Had a lot of heart, but unless he lands the big one and gets Buster out of there, I think Douglas will beat him again. Thank you very much, Gil Clancy and Angelo Dundee. If a Chicago alderman outwitted Gorbachev or Lafayette High School crushed the 49ers, Buster Douglas' victory would still top them all. So what does the future now hold for the heavyweight division? Douglas is in a position to dictate. He has already dictated that there won't be a quick rematch. And what about... And what about top contender Evander Holyfield? It'll take a check with a lot of zeros on it to get him to step aside. My goal is to be the heavyweight champ, like I said. And, you know, I looked at Douglas. Douglas is a very smart fight, smart fighter, and I have to prepare myself to fight Douglas. That's the man that I have to fight. Until Don comes to me and says to me, Shell, I'd like to do something because I have a match or I have a tentative match or I'm planning to make a match, I'm sticking with the position that we're the next um, challenger. If he comes to me and says to me at that point, I can make a deal with Buster Douglas and I can do blah, blah, blah. If blah, blah, blah makes sense, Dan and Ken Sanders and I will talk about it. If not, we're going to look to fight the Buster Douglas. 
So what and when will it be? So Mike Tyson wants an immediate rematch. But should he? Now that he's been exposed as a mere vulnerable human, will he be as domineering in the future? And can Buster Douglas sustain a level of excellence that is new for him? Mike, I sense a, a kind of agitation on your part that Buster Douglas and his manager are now talking about not wanting to fight in June, maybe wanting to fight in September, maybe fighting Holyfield first. Uh, what's that make you feel? Well, you know, I mean, um, I'm just saying basically as a fighter, when I, when I was champion, I, you know, I didn't discriminate. I fought anyone you put in front of me. And I gave him an opportunity when he really didn't, um, wasn't a mandatory contender. But, you know, I mean, if, I think it would only be rightful for him to do the same. But then again, I mean, if he figures he doesn't want to and he wants to fight Holofield, you know, regardless, you know, I mean, let him do what he feels better. And what do you feel, Buster? It's not up to me, honestly. You know, it's what the best offer. Um, that's up to Don King and John Johnson. So whoever they come up with, then I'll fight. Uh, I was only speaking to Holyfield after the title fight was because he was supposed to fight the winner. He's the number one contender. He's the number one contender. So if it was, he wants to step back and let Mike fight me, then I, it doesn't matter. I'll fight whoever. Are you concerned that if you were to go into the ring with Mike again and lose, that people would say you were a fluke? No, it, it, you can't consider that fight a fluke because it went 10 rounds. I got up off the canvas. I was winning the fight, then I, and then I won the fight. I mean, it's different if it was like a one shot, one punch, a one punch knockout, you know, a punch coming out of the blue and, and landing, but I was dominating the fight. Mike, again, as a student of history, you know that uh, Joe Lewis didn't fight Max Schmeling again for two years. After he took a beating, uh, Muhammad Ali didn't fight Joe Frazier again for three years. What is the rush? The fight won't go away, will it? It won't go away, but you know, I just want to, I just want to get in there. And yeah. I know he's just holding in on me, a temporary resident. That's all. Is it hard to be without the title? Hey, you know, I mean, when you really think about, it, you know, I've been successful. You know, I mean, and it's been very rewarding, but you know, this is the business. I, I like the title. More so than all, the money is great, and the rewards of the, what the title brought is great. But, you know, I, you know, I mean, I want to, I want to give my performance. Out of the whole fight, the only thing I was disappointed in, I wasn't disappointed in losing, you know what I mean? Because that's part of this the fight business. I understand the business. The only thing I was disappointed in was just my performance. And, you know what I mean, the fact was supposed to fought a great fight. I was just only dis disappointed in my performance. Do you feel it's in your best interest? You've seen fighters uh, after a a, uh, a tough, really hard fight that it might not be a good idea to come right back, that it might be a, an idea to sit back and, and wait. Please, spare me. <laughs> spare you what? <laughs> yeah, I, I doubt that happening. <laughs> well, that's the way a fighter should think about it. Uh, Buster, what have been your moves? I noticed that when you came to New York, you were originally supposed to stay in Donald Trump's hotel, but your manager didn't want you to stay there because uh, he didn't want to create the impression that you were beholden to Trump for a future promotion. Uh, at the time, you were still not uh, really all together with King. How independent are you going to be, can you be, in the situation you're in, in which Don King has options on your services? Well, I can't really elaborate on that because that's not my end of the, um, the boxing. All I think I do is fight. I fight whoever they put in front of me. You know, that's that's John Johnson. He's the one that's running. He can, he controls all the business aspect of it. Then he confers them with me. Mike, you've seen fighters after they lose their first fight and they're feeling that they're inv invulnerable. They start to get a little tentative and they go downhill. How would you guard against that? Well, like you said before, you know, I'm a student of the game, please. I mean, these things happen. It's just temporary minor setback for a few seconds, a month or two months, whatever the situation is. And I mean, like you say, I'm in good enough spirits to fight today. I mean, I feel great. You know what I mean? And about people reading the same, you know I mean, by no means me and Don King, by, you know, I'm just getting off the subject for a minute, are collaborating to do anything uh, diabolical to take any titles. You know I mean, all that, you know, bullshit you know what I mean? We just was here, we had a team once as my advisor, Team Tyson, you know what I mean? And his business is to look after my situation at that particular moment. But for all means, nobody tried to 
to the fact that you see he got the title, you know what I mean? And for as long as he has it or regardless, you know what I mean, he's happy until the time comes we fight again. Buster, can you sustain a level of excellence that you have never achieved before? Yes. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Does it give you a new sense of who you are as an athlete? Yeah, well, yes, it does. I've, uh, I know I can do it. It's not something that I was shocked. I was fighting over my head. I was fighting within James Douglas. I was just the best came out of James Douglas. I was up for the fight, and I'll always be up for the fights. Now being heavyweight champion of the world, undisputed. Mike, you were perceived before this fight as invincible, Frankenstein, a monster. Now you're looked upon as human, someone who bleeds, who falls when he's hit often enough. Is that a plus for you in some way? You know, I mean, from what I never look, I never believe my in my news clippings. You know, you guys read. And I basically know who I am. And my basic main concern is that he fought a good night, but I know I'm the best fighter in the world still to this day. And if he feels he is, he's going to have to prove it again, unless he wants to run off and fight Evander. <laughs> Buster, you're a hero now. Can you handle being a hero? How has it been? It's been great. I came home uh, to a, uh, my, my house was just uh, decorated. The neighbors had decorated my home with balloons, uh, signs, champ country. Uh, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Buster. Thank you, Mike, for both coming in here to tell us more about that remarkable night in Tokyo last week. Do you get the feeling they're still not best friends? But money doesn't just talk in prize fighting, it shouts, it screams. So it's almost certain there'll be a rematch this year. If I managed Buster Douglas, I'd say to him, whoopee, we're gonna make so much money, our grandchildren will be able to retire on it. But let's not rush into anything. Don't let the money men stampede us. Now you're a hero. Let's kick back for six months and enjoy it. And this is exactly what his manager, John Johnson, is saying to him. If I were managing Mike Tyson, however, I'd take a different tack. I'd say to him, Mike, you just took a beating. I think you'll beat him up next time. But if you get another punishing fight, or if you happen to lose again, it could be fatal for your career. You're still only 23. Let's not rush into this. Relax for a few months. Go back to the gym take a couple of fights, and then we'll get the title back. Be that as it probably won't be, two athletes in the purest form of competition gave us a jolt of inspiring theater, a seemingly indestructible force, probably overconfident, was brought to his knees by an underdog galvanized by opportunity and personal tragedy to fight the fight of his life, which reminded us with savage eloquence that if there's a skinny man trying to get out of every fat man, there's also a hero trying to get out of every ordinary man.